Good morning. Thank you, uh, John, for me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is, uh, I'm so happy uh, that John did not take Dr. Varga that we're going to have a picnic in the lake today. It's a meeting place, so it's a perfect location. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I have to congratulate you for, first of all because you are ahead of the game. The fact that you are here learning about this facts and uh, learning about this condition more and more every year, it is a tremendous, tremendous step ahead compared to anyone else who may or may not have this condition. So first of all, you have to have the first applause yourself uh, for being here, so I'm very happy to have you. Second, I have to uh, thank again uh, the uh, organization group as well as the my Foundation. They do tremendous things about this condition. Now I'm going to take some time to speak about pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma. And please uh, feel free to stop me if something here is not understood well, so don't hesitate to do that. We may be a little bit longer in time, but that's okay. We'll figure it out how to catch up. So let's start. Why should I bother really to learn about this? I think more than important than why to bother about is, is, is it important to understand these complications? Do we really need to make an effort to understand what this is? I believe so, because pulmonary hypertension that we'll speak in, in more detail is often diagnosed late when someone has a scleroderma. And when it's diagnosed late, it's much more difficult to have it. So it's also that causes different symptoms and the usual ones that you are described by your rheumatologist about what scleroderma will give you. So it's important to recognize those symptoms. Can it have different origins within scleroderma patients? Pulmonary hypertension can be from different conditions within the scleroderma spectrum of conditions. And it can be treated, and patients can improve. We have to remember, we have treatments for this disease as well. So we have to understand it first and recognize it. So we're going to start basic. And I want to make sure that I don't insult your intelligence if I go with details in this aspect. But first, let's do a quick review about how the circulation works. If you see in the blue aspects of this graph is where the venous blood comes into the body. That lands into the right side of the heart, then it gets pushed into the lungs by the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery takes it into the lungs, and then you can see how that conversion of those blue blood, uh, blue vessels go into red vessels. That's after the exchange of the carbon dioxide and then the, uh, to obtain the um, oxygen, and then it takes that blood back into the left side of the heart and it gets pushed out into the rest of the body. As you can see, the right side of the heart, which is what it handles the blue blood, only has to work through the lungs. The most of the deal here throughout the body happens to be the left side of the heart, which is the usual muscular side of the heart. It has to pump blood against gravity, so it takes the biggest load. The right, right side of the heart is a relatively lazy side of the heart. It doesn't really have to do a lot. It just pushes right in there. So what happens in pulmonary hypertension? In pulmonary hypertension, we have some instances where we see the same circulation. Obviously, that doesn't change. But if you look at that explosion there of that little vessels, you see in the upper corner, normal blood vessels, the blood flows freely. So it doesn't have any problems. Think about it. The same amount of blood that goes through the rest of the body has to pass through the lungs. So it is a lot. It's a big network of vessels that have to be very extensible. When we exercise and we move, boom, we have to open up those vessels because we need to accommodate. In pulmonary hypertension, the blood flow slows down as is pictured in the lower skin in the same graph as well. And we'll explain that a little bit more. So this is an old cartoon that has been published and is used a lot by physicians educating other physicians. So I'm going to give it to you now. What happens in those vessels? When we have pulmonary arterial hypertension, we see changes, as uh, Dr. Boss with masterfully, masterfully described, some factors that influence disease processes. In this case, we can see collagen vascular disease, congenital heart disease, some other conditions can actually become a risk factor to the pulmonary hypertension. There are many reasons for pulmonary hypertension. We'll dig a little bit more into scleroderma. But then that big vessel that can accommodate a lot of flow, with time, it becomes thicker, as you can see in the next uh, cartoon here. So some injury happens to that vessel that is not completely well understood. Something potentiates this, 
And actually, there are some patients who are susceptible to have this, as it was briefly explained before. And then it gets to the point of disease progression, which is the third element of this cartoon, that it explains about what an advanced vascular lesion is. So you have mini tumors sometimes that deform in those areas of the vessel. We're talking about a hair-like sized vessel, very small vessels, capillary ones, where the blood flow obviously gets slowed down. Sometimes we get some thrombosis, meaning clots in those areas as well. They are microscopic and actually they cannot be really seen by any particular imaging study. But we can see how changes in the muscle, changes in the, in the thin layers that normally should, should happen, should be that way, now becomes bigger and makes the lumen or the space of that vessel to be smaller. That's exactly what happens in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So then how do we see, how does the heart see that? Again, this is a continuation of the story I told you. So similar cartoon on, the, on, the, on your left side, so you see it's normal circulation. But then what happens when we have a constant insult of those vessels being narrow, the one that suffers is the right side of the heart. And what does it tend to do? It tends to end up. She tries to say, oh my goodness, I can't deal with pressure. The right side of the heart is not good to deal with pressure. It's very good to deal with volume. You can put a lot of volume in there and can handle it. But as soon as you start incrementing the pressure, it gets into trouble and it starts to dilate and it starts to congest and it starts actually to make the people know that the person who suffers is not well. Yet. So what does it happen? Again, this is a, a continuation of the same. So that right side of the heart, as you can see on this picture on your right side, it starts to enlarge. It starts to try to build some muscle. I said, okay, I gotta be like the left side now because the left side is the one that deals with pressure. Now I'm seeing pressure. But the right side is not designed to do that. It wasn't born with that signals or with the ability to have that growth. It does to a degree, but it never to a greater success. So it, that's why symptoms start to occur when this happens. And that's when the heart failure component, or right heart failure component of pulmonary hypertension might ease. So when I say about pulmonary hypertension, and again, this is life. Can't help it. I tried to help it, but I have to show you this. In Nice in 2013, they classify pulmonary hypertension because pulmonary hypertension can be from many origins. And it was classified in five different groups. Group one, PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Arterial because happens in the artery and the capillary artery vessel. And that actually encompasses what I just showed you before. It shows you the changes in the vessel. All those uh, lists of diseases that you see <coughs> have more potential um, risk factors create those changes. They may, not in every single case. Not everybody who has HIV infection gets pulmonary arterial hypertension. Only 0.5 people with HIV get pulmonary hypertension. And I'll explain more about connective tissue disease because that's where scleroderma sits in this category. But then, if you take a survey, well, actually that has been done, we know when we look at pulmonary hypertension itself, high pressure in the lungs, what is the most common cause of high pressure in the lungs? Group two, due to left heart disease. Because it's much more prevalent to have left heart problems. It's much more prevalent to have systemic high blood pressure. It's much more prevalent to have heart failure from coronary artery disease, ischemia, so on and so forth, people who have cavus, valvular <coughs> disease, etc. That's actually the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension. Then we have lung diseases. That's group three. Anything that causes oxygen in our lungs tends to say this to the body. It says, if you are not going to give me oxygen in those lungs, I am not going to give you blood flow. That's actually the response of the, of, the, of the vessels, and they try to clench. That's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So all those conditions listed there can do that. And actually, when they do that, either in an intermittent basis or in a constant basis, like they have this in patients with emphysema, that actually creates a constant strain of high pressure to the right side of the heart mimicking what I just mentioned before, without having to have all those little changes that I showed you. So then we have chronic clots, and then we can have the classic multifactorial mechanism. We always have people that we can't put them anywhere. So these are all the diseases that can actually increase pulmonary pressures, but I want you to focus on the group one disease where scleroderma usually is considered, but the scleroderma can have a share of some others too. So talking about a little bit of the statistics for what we know about it, you have that in your pamphlet. One in eight, um, that's pH of course in about five to 12% of patients with scleroderma. So is that exactly true? I, in the recent study, which is the bottom of this graph says, 
uh, that detects that patients who are at risk, patients who have more risk factors to develop mental protection with scleroderma, happens to be a little bit higher. We said about 19% of those patients may have pulmonary arterial hypertension. 20% uh, what it means is, according to large registries, scleroderma related to pulmonary hypertension, that is the proportion of patients that actually accomplish from the big group of PH. So yes, it is a very important <coughs> group within the people like me that like to study and see patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Scleroderma is a very important group of patients because it's close to 20% of those. What are the risk factors for PAH and scleroderma? Some of those were already discussed in some detail. So longer duration of disease has been proposed to be a risk factor for that. Limited disease versus diffuse disease. Uh, abnormal pulmonary function test, particularly that test called diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. What does that mean? That's one of the tests I'm sure that you have a pulmonary function test, or some of you have. That study actually reflects what is the ability of the lung to actually take carbon monoxide, which mimics the ability to take oxygen as well. So that kid tends to be impaired in a scleroderma when it's related to pulmonary arterial hypertension. And some degree of antibody profile that I don't want to say again as it was very well explained moments ago. So why is this graph put in here? Because we have learned with time and now it's proven that if we screen, if we understand, we physicians, we understand this disease, we can actually make people diagnose earlier. And I told you before, diagnosis earlier is always better for any condition. So this is data from the French. They actually were very good at understanding this. And if you look in the graph on, the, on your left side, this is actually what happened with people who were not screened. Nobody thought about having PAH, and they just waited for the disease to manifest. And they found that what it says there in the x-axis, WHO functional class, that means how, uh, what is the ability for those patients to walk? In heart failure, it's defined like one to four. Four, somebody cannot walk because it's so short of breath, and one is doing the daily activities, two and three is in between. So most of these people were actually diagnosed in class three, meaning that they were short of breath with activities of daily living for most part. So that is not what we want to see. We want to see people diagnosed earlier with less symptoms. And then they, thought, they saw that when they screen and they pay attention to this, they found that more patients with earlier uh, difficulties or less difficulties were actually diagnosed. And actually that is a great thing because in very few diseases we're being able to diagnose things earlier. So we learned this. So what do we do to do a, a, a diagnostic evaluation for pulmonary hypertension? For, by the way, are we okay so far? Are we, everything is being understood clearly? Yeah. Okay. So, symptoms of pulmonary hypertension, goodness gracious, this is a hard topic. Because if you go to a primary care physician and you say, do I have pulmonary hypertension because I feel short of breath? Goodness, I mean, it is not usually how it is. If you put all these symptoms and you give it to a primary care physician, he's going to say, no, you don't have pulmonary hypertension. It's more likely that you have asthma. It's more likely that you have um, another type of heart condition because there are so non-specific read through them. There are so many things that actually can give you this type of symptoms. With physicians, it is a problem because there is, we cannot identify this disease by symptoms. When we get already somebody who is very short of breath and has a lack of scleroderma, then we can start thinking, goodness, so this, this was going on for a while. So we need to understand, but you need to know what it is because it's important you're here, you're learning this, and you have it there to take it. Pulmonary function test is part of the diagnostic evaluation. This is one of the most hated tests in the pulmonary <laughs> world. Um, and actually, I have taken it myself. It's horrendous. And you know, I can tell you, when I, when I had it myself, as I said, that technician does not like me. That's what I like. I, I can't breathe out anymore. Uh, but no, they keep saying, keep breathing out, 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 out. And, they, and I had a patient who says, that technician is rude. She keeps yelling at me. <laughs> that's actually how the test is supposed to be. They are trained to yell at people to say you have to do the best possible. So that they stop their foot on the ground for someone to start breathing and you breathe completely out. So spirometry, lung volumes, and carbon monoxide for diffusion capacity are the three major tests of what we call the big chunk of pulmonary function tests. They're very likely any of you will be sent. Uh, those give us different information. The spirometry tells us how 
how is our functional capacity when we do it forcefully, how much air we can actually expel in our lungs or inhale when we do it forcefully. Lung volumes tell us in general how much air we can really keep in our lungs. And carbon monoxide diffusion capacity tells us the diffusion facility that I explained to you about. In a scleroderma, one of the most important tests is the bottom one, diffusion capacity. And it's not an easy one because you people need to excel for 10 seconds. And if you think about it, just to keep excelling for 10 seconds is not an easy task for me. And then we go into making you exercise. And then who likes to exercise? Some people, some others don't. But six minute walk test. It is a test that usually uh, you may have had, but actually it's a mini exercise test just to see what is the ability for someone or how, how, how long someone can walk uh, in a six minute uh, period of time. And then we measure oxygen levels, we measure blood pressure before the test and the response of the heart rate. And then we can have more complicated or sophisticated tests, cardiopulmonary exercise test which uh, is a test that can give us differentiation about what happens to our physiology when we exercise. How is the lung contribution to your shortness of breath and what is the heart contribution to your shortness of breath? We can have an idea. But we can even say, no, you're very deconditioned. You need your muscles to work more. We can figure these things out with this type of testing. Again, it tends to be brutal for people who have done it if you feel that way. But it's doable, it's safe. That's the most important thing. People think, think doctor is sending me here to die with this test, but it's not, believe me. It's actually a test that is difficult to do, but it is considered to be still safe. And now, what the most important test, and I'm gonna uh, leave this, uh, Dr. Frick uh, later is gonna speak in detail about heart. Um, this is an echocardiogram. This is the study that actually has taken a big center of our diagnostic uh, protocol for pulmonary hypertension. That image actually, is, if you think about, you are picking up the heart from the uh, tip and then you hang it and that's what you're looking at on the left side on your left side is the right side of the heart the right ventricle on top the right uh, uh, atrium on bottom so this is not working uh, the <coughs> one on the left is the obviously the left side of, of the heart on your right there so this actually gives us an idea of the size of the right ventricle, the size of the left ventricle, the function and size of right atrium and, and, and left atrium as well, septum and structures. A lot of information we can get from an echo. It doesn't hurt. It's just called by the gel that it gets. Some people actually warm it up, which is a good idea. But uh, actually, it is a very, very informative test. And then we're going to cardiac catheterization. Another fear test. Yes, I am the bad guy. I am usually one of the bad guys because often we have to send you for a right heart cath. Because if we suspect if we have the possibility of pulmonary hypertension, we need to confirm it. It's a small tube of soft, flexible plastic that is introduced after you have numbed either your neck or your groin by lidocaine. That tube goes all the way into your heart through that system that you are seeing there, and then actually through a balloon, it gets moved um, into the circulation, the pulmonary circulation, where we can actually measure pressures at every level of the right side of the heart, and actually can give us ideas of the left side of the heart. So it is of a very minimal risk. It's studied in experienced centers who manage patients with pulmonary hypertension and diagnose uh, patients with this disease. The risk of fatalities or side effects from this CAT procedure itself is actually less than 1%. It tends to be 0.5% or so. So it's very, very small. So it's more fear than what the risk is. There is no general anesthesia required. It takes about an hour, I would say, and I exaggerate that. It takes more of the timing of the, the, the processing and the preparation of the patient and then the discharge, but it's extremely important test. This is a slide that, again, this is probably for you to take home later on and, and read it in more detail because it would take me one hour to go in detail, but this is, has been one of the most important studies in the field of pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma. Why? Because a group of physicians and participated in this institution as well, trying to figure out what the French already said. They said, if a screening is better, now teach me how to screen. That's actually how this study was designed and say, okay, tell me what needs to look at a patient with a scleroderma. And that's what that says. The step one, it says, if we have a patient with potential pulmonary hypertension or non-scleroderma, look at those factors that you have there. 
what are the Puna function tests? Is the diffusion too low? Do we have the antiectasis or not? Do we have anti-centromere antibody? Do we have some markers of heart condition, et cetera? Certain markers that have been prospectively studied already and validated to have some rationale to say, okay, it's a risk factor for pulmonary hypertension, then give certain number of points. And that's what that other one small one says, what points we give for what? And that's, again, very difficult statistical work. Then move into step two and to see what the echocardiogram is telling you. And then you can actually move and decide this patient needs a right heart cath, this patient doesn't need a right heart cath. And what this, at the end of the day, says, I can actually see what patient actually is going to benefit from getting a right heart cath. And if I don't do it, which is that box over here, that is the one that tells me I don't miss any. I am okay. I can feel comfortable. You don't have it. I don't need to send you for a right heart cath, and I prove that that's the case. So big advancements in science in screening of pulmonary hypertension, and this definitely saves lives. <coughs> yes. So it's basically a point system. So you put the risk points, and actually the points. Um, let me do it here. Again, I don't know if it can be seen, but the points are assigned here by the different levels of our different conditions that you have here, which are the same here. So if you have a total risk points of more than 300, you go into a no, and you don't do an echocardiogram because you don't have enough risk factors. Is that what you're asking? No, so if, I, if I'm a patient, I have the uh, pulmonary functional test results. Okay. So my uh, CV is whatever the percentage, so how should I pay attention to below what percentage I, I need to be aware of? Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. So all this, it has been already defined by this particular paper as well. I think I will leave that to your physician. Right now what you're learning is to say, this, I have this number low, I learned that I have to, am I at risk of pulmonary hypertension? But it's not a single value. A single value hasn't been sufficient yet enough to make a risk. So that's why it has to be a, a multiplication, an addition of these values to say that you're at risk or not. But I can tell you, in real life, what happens. Many times, if you get an echo and the echocardiogram shows pulmonary hypertension, by all means, we'll see and we'll decide already if you meet those criteria or not. Because this, this is actually to detect the classic PAS. Look at it. Anticentromere antibodies. <coughs> it was spoken about. Anticentromere antibodies are much more defined or, or, or noticed to be related to PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension. But what if you have ILD? An ILD can actually give you pulmonary hypertension. So is that validated for those patients? No, this is only for PAH. So pulmonary hypertension, and not with the meaning to confuse you, this is actually for that small subgroup only. But again, it's an additive. There hasn't been a single test that can say you go straight to right heart cath, and it has been validated. So, again, going into this conversation, not, pulmon not all pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary arterial hypertension. We need a detailed and accurate evaluation. We need to have experience on this. You need someone who has been doing this for years. Sometimes treatments are worse when the disease is not understood. So don't take it for granted that you have this. You have to be educated about this because treatments actually can be bad as it was. We don't have yet that precision personalized medicine that was discussed by Dr. Boswell moments ago, which would be ideal. It would be ideal that we get a, a printout of this is what you need based on your confirmation. We are not there yet. So we need to use our best decision making. And not all the treatments are the same for everyone, again, going into the same uh, discussion. So for example, left heart disease, group two, I mentioned to you in the big uh, uh, classification from NIS. Systolic heart dysfunction, left side of the heart not working, or left side of the heart being too stiff can give you pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Fried will go on this in detail. We need to make sure that that is understood. Pulmonary fibrosis, scar tissue in the lungs, ILD. It was mentioned with those letters before, by, uh, previously. So pulmonary fibrosis actually is not uncommon, particularly in diffuse scleroderma. And then we can actually have pulmonary hypertension from this because the vessels get encroached by this scar tissue. And if you encroach these vessels and they are narrow, of course you're going to have a high pressure system. But you may not need to have an extensive amount of fibrosis or extensive amount of ILD. As soon as if, you're, if your oxygen level is low, particularly when you walk, which is a very common feature of this condition, you can actually start having elements 
that can cause pulmonary hypertension from this condition even if it's early on. Clots, is it possible? So it hasn't been yet considered scleroderma risk factor for chronic thrombolytic pulmonary hypertension. However, autoimmune disease itself has a procoagulant effect. We do believe that autoimmunity in general can have some procoagulant effect, meaning that we can form clots more. Should I be scared about this? We pulmonary hypertension specialists, if you get to us and I'd send it by Dr. Hinchcliffe or Dr. Vargas and say, okay, pulmonary hypertension, it is my duty to make sure that there are no clots sitting in the lungs. And I have tests for that. That's called a VQ scan, and that test will tell me if clots big enough may be sitting, that can be extracted by surgery, it can happen as well. So in these cases, it's curative and people feel much better when it's related to this. Then making sure that no other elements exist. So let's say we diagnose, what do we do after that? Very complicated, again, okay. treatments for pulmonary arterial hypertension have been focused in what is the mechanism of disease. So if you see on this a scheme, that's a vessel on top. So we're looking at a little cell, um, a smooth muscle cell. So we have three major pathways of attack for patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Again, endothelial pathway, prostacyclin and nitric oxide pathway. So this graph actually shows you on red contractile pathways in blue dilatory pathways, meaning that opens the vessel or closes the vessel. So what does that mean? Endothelium pathway, we have a lot of endothelium, a molecule that actually is very vasoconstricted. We try to block it. We have endothelium blockers. Prostacyclin pathway, prostacyclins are elements that actually dilate vessels. We have little of that in pulmonary hypertension, so we have to give it back. Nitric oxide pathway, we don't have enough nitric oxide. Nitric oxide dilates this, and that's actually what we use. We use mechanisms with, me with medications to create more nitric oxide, so we dilate more that vessel. So those are the three major pathways that we know right now. And again, does each one of those work for everybody? No. Again, I wish we would know more personalized medicine about which one treatment works better for different people. But they do work. They, that is, there is no question about it, and it has been studied. So does it work fantastically? No, it doesn't cure the disease. Pulmonary arterial hypertension yet is not a curable disease, but it's controlled. So we have to pay attention to that. It is also important to know that these medications have to be well justified. Not anybody can get it. We need to understand the disease because they are extremely, extremely expensive and difficult to get if we don't have the right medication and the right insurance company to pay for that. Unfortunately, that's the life we did. Horribly busy slide, okay? So don't kill me because this is very difficult to interpret, but the one thing I want to tell you here, if you go on that arrow that goes from top to bottom on the very left, that tells you the timeline of medication development. And these all medications that you see here are actually medications that work through all those different pathways I mentioned to you. What it means is the ones that are more towards the left are more for tri or trial <coughs> or investigating patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension group one. That box I showed you at the beginning, including scleroderma, goes that way. But then more towards the scleroderma or connective tissue disease have been studied on the right. So we have a little bit more data, which is less than for the general group of PAH, but it has been studied. Now, lately we have the first combination therapy trial that actually came up, which is the Ambrisent and Tadalafil medications out of Johns Hopkins. It tells us that actually medications in combination work for patients with connective tissue disease, with scleroderma in particular in this study. So we're learning more and more. Why? Because people like you are sitting in places like this and then you understand that if later on I tell you, you know what, I need to have, you need to help us to get into a research trial, because that's what we need. We need more of this side of the equation. We need to understand more in scleroderma how it works, because we cannot extrapolate everything that is for other diseases for scleroderma. So it's happening. So I congratulate you for anyone here who has participated in the research trial, because it really helps the community in general. And then what do we do? Again, this is incredible crazy. Treatment naive patient, somebody who does not have any treatment. So what is we diagnosed by a right heart cat that has pulmonary hypertension? It's isolated pulmonary arterial hypertension. We know it's group one.
So we need to see how severe that is. So we go on that side. We need to see what is the functional capacity. We need to see how much the patient walks. What are the cardiopulmonary testing the, uh, elements that we need to put together? Then we have to do general measures. We have to decide, okay, we need to give oxygen to the patient. We need to give diuretics. We need to give anticoagulation or blood thinners. What therapies are we going to use out of the ones that I described to you? So again, that is going to be a decision that we usually make together because these therapies can be from pills to intravenous continuous infusion, as many of you may have heard, hypoprostenol or treprostinil, remodeling, floran, those are the usual names of the continuous infusion. We can go from pills, inhaled therapies, to a combination of therapies, including intravenous. So what is the specific drug therapy? Or is the patient good for a clinical trial? We don't know exactly what's happening. Are we trying something new that is promising? Then let's go that way as a decision. So then we evaluate the response to treatment, the green box. If it's adequate, then we're happy. But that patient needs to be seen frequently, at least every three months by us. It cannot be longer than that. That's the minimum that is required by guidance. And then inadequate, the treatment is not working well, then we have to consider other reasons. We always have to keep in mind, is that patient developing some left heart disease that wasn't at the beginning. Everything is dynamic, nothing is boxed. If you were diagnosed with one thing one time, you age. I mean, we're grateful that we all age. But when we <laughs> age, guess what? We get high blood pressure, we get all that. We don't, we're not free of those things. So can we get other diseases? We always have to keep our eyes open on that. So if it's not working well, or if something is not working again, then should we add medicines? Should we do transplantation? You know now the long transplantation for pulmonary arterial hypertension is actually doable and is not riskier as it was thought before. So, which is new data as well, recent, relatively recent data. Long transplant is a curative treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension and scleroderma. Obviously, it's an exchange of problems. You get one problem resolved, but then you get a bunch of others because you're going to get a long transplant. You get, it actually increases quality and length of life. And then we are going to continue to evaluate the patient in, in diff with different aspects. So we have to be on top. PAH in scleroderma requires astute physician, astute patient. Can't be one-sided approach. So, a little advertisement. At Northwestern, the pulmonary hypertension program, we actually got the accreditation by the Pulmonary Hypertension Association as a center of comprehensive care. Only about 30 centers in the United States have been accredited this very rigorous system that actually required to have people like Dr. Varga and Dr. Hinchcliffe here. So we need to have a very good connected tissue disease group. We have to have very good cat lab. We have to have very good experienced physician. I've been doing this for close to 18 years now. So you have to have the background how to have this. So we got this. So we have to actually make sure that everybody is treated in the best possible way. So those are the physicians that we work. We are actually two pulmonologists, three cardiologists, a nurse practitioner, two nurses, and a patient liaison. So it's a big group just from the pulmonary hypertension perspective to maintain this certification. Well, what is important to know now at the end? We have to tackle it. We know that we should screen. We have better understanding of the disease. It's not perfect. Patient education is extremely important. I can't help say it more and more. And a specialized center play a major role for particularly early treatment. So hopefully we can get to cure at some point. And that is all I have. Thank you very much for your attention.